Boy, it's just so much in life to worry about. We worry about our money, we worry about our health, we worry about our relationships, we worry about our jobs, we worry about our careers. And so in my moments with you today, by the time we are finished, you won't have to worry anymore. I don't care what it's about. I don't care what is provoking it, what is irritating, exacerbating, frustrating. We want to lift the burden based on God's word of worry. Three times we are commanded in this passage not to worry. Verse 25 says, for this reason I say to you, do not worry. Verse 31 says, do not worry then. Verse 34 says, so do not worry. Three times there is a command not to worry. Therefore, to worry is sin. If something is a command and you disobey it, it's called sin. Most people do not look as wary as sin. They look at it as natural. Look at it as something that is legit given the circumstances that I am facing. Yet the Lord in this passage gives a command and he couples the command with this statement. O oh, ye of little faith. You believe I can take you to heaven, you just don't believe I can cover you on earth. You believe I'm good for eternity, but I'm insufficient for time. Do not worry. The word worry, anxiety, means to be torn in two. Worry is concern on steroids. Worry is concern that's gone haywire. There is a difference between concern and worry. Concern is, I have an issue in my life that is troubling me and I am setting forth a plan as best I can to address it. That is legitimate concern. But worry is where the concern controls you. It is where because of the concern I can't sleep. Because of the concern I can't control my temper. Because of the concern I am losing my ability to cope. It is where concern has now become the controlling factor because of the issue, whatever it is that you face. Now, let me give a clarification here. I am not talking about uh, chemical imbalance where there is a physical chemical reality that needs to be addressed because that physical is affecting that emotional and absolutely that may need medication. That is not to what I am addressing. What I am addressing is where the circumstance in and of itself is controlling you. It is dictating who you are, where you are, how you function, whether you function, it tells you if you can get up in the morning and tells you you better go to bed right now. It owns you. Well, he says in introducing this section, for this reason, and then he tells you don't worry. For this reason. So before he tells you don't worry, he says there's a reason. So you can't understand not to worry unless you understand the reason. So he says for this reason, which means we have to back up a few verses. And in verse 22, this is what he says. The eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth, because one of the big worries of life has to do with resources. He says, if you want to get over worry, you got to get rid of one of your masters. Worry will track you down 
if you've got more than one master. He says, if you've got God over here and something else in control over there, since the definition of worry is to be torn in two, and you've got two different masters going in two different directions, then they will keep you worried because you, they will keep you torn. He says the light is in the eye. If the light is in the eye, then the whole body knows what to grab, where to walk. The whole body can function because it's seeing things clearly. But if the eyes are dark, everything else is in trouble. The hands are in trouble. It doesn't know what it's grabbing. The feet are in trouble. It doesn't know where it's going. It says everything else is in trouble if there's darkness in the eye. If there is not clear sight because you have become divided with masters. One of the reasons why we stay worried is we stay divided between masters. He says, you cannot serve two masters. And when you do, you will be worried because you will be divided. The spiritual division creates or supports the ongoing nature of worry. If you are divided, double-minded, if you are distracted in terms of having master, and a master is somebody who tells you what to do. A master is somebody who controls the priorities of life. He says, do not worry, O ye of little faith. He now says, he goes a little deeper. He says, if you are consumed by worry, if worry is your middle name, if you weren't worrying, you wouldn't know what to do with yourself. He says, you don't understand God. You don't understand his nature and you don't understand his providence. And you don't understand his priorities. Notice what he says in verse 25. He says, I say to you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or as to your body, as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and body more than raiment? He says, folk get worried about the wrong thing. You get worried about what you are going to eat. You ought to be worried about whether you're going to get up to eat anything. Because life is more than food. you worried about food, but you are alive. Because if you don't have life, you don't have to worry about food. So if you have life, you can assume food. He says the body is more than raiment. The body is more than clothes. We worry about Old clothes, new clothes, torn clothes, sewed up clothes. We worry about clothes. He says, you worried about the wrong thing. You need to worry about whether your body's in, intact to put your arms through those sleeves. Messed up priorities. He says, he says in verse 26, have you ever paid attention to nature? He says, have you ever, have, have you ever, have you ever studied nature? Because he says in verse 26, look at the birds. Look at the birds. Because he says they don't sow nor reap or gather in the bonds and your heavenly father feeds them. Not their heavenly father, your heavenly father. Aren't you not worth, worth much more than they? They assume there will be a worm somewhere today with their name on it. They assume that. So they get up singing. We get up fussing, cussing, and complaining. The birds get, he says, have you not looked at the birds? Are you not worth much more than they? He says, clothing. He says, Solomon was not arrayed like the lilies of the field. The, the, the lilies of the field, they neither toil nor spin. You, you've never seen a, a lily using a sewing machine, calling on Singer to keep my pedal on. 
See, you, you don't see that. He says, because God works it out in nature. See, the thing is, we don't know who we're dealing with. And so we find ourselves under the stranglehold of worry. And yet he says, don't do it. It's a sin. And when you do it, you elevate the natural over the supernatural. Man over God. And you're telling me you are your God. And you live divided and torn. So it shouldn't surprise us that Isaiah 26 verses 3 and 4, I will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on me. It shouldn't surprise us that 2 Thessalonians 3 verses 6 to 8 says God gives peace in every circumstance. Now don't, don't get me wrong. I am not suggesting that life does not get hard. I am not suggesting that. We all know better than that. Jesus said in John 16, in this world you will have tribulation. But then he's going to bounce right off of that and say, be of good cheer. <laughs> say, what? You just told me I'm going, I can expect trouble and then you're going to tell me, cheer up and sing. When we understand, when God allows trouble in our lives, I'm not talking about trouble we create now. I'm talking about trouble that he allows that would create the insecurity that drives us from concern to worry. That what he is creating in your situation is an opportunity to see that he's God. Okay, okay. So the next time you are tempted to worry beyond concern, concern is where you have a real issue and you are seeking a way to resolve it. Worry is where it has taken over the concern and it is a controlling you. The next time you are tempted to worry, you must now look at that as an opportunity for God to let you see how much God he is. Paul put it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. He said, God gave us a great ordeal of affliction. So we were down to the point where we didn't even know whether we were going to live. It got that bad. But then he adds a phrase, and he did it so that we could see he is the one who raises the dead. He did it so he could let us see he's God. When worry is seeping in. That is a call to faith in the midst of the legitimacy of the concern. So what do you do? What do you do? Verse 32, for the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Okay, this is a little embarrassing because what he says is, when you worry, you have now joined the ranks of pagans. The Gentiles, the non-believers, the pagans, he says, they break their necks, mismanage their priorities, because they got to make it happen themselves. They seek, they seek to control it. Why? Because they are their own gods. But you got a daddy. Your heavenly father. God gets insulted when we question his capacity, his ability, and his intentionality to cover the needs of his people. Now, I'm not talking about every want. I'm not talking about every desire. He's talking about he knows you need these things. He's talking about the needs of life. He says, stop being pagans because he says, I'm talking about your daddy. But your daddy has also got to be your master. 
I love Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8 because he says God will keep you from worrying in a drought. A drought is when there is no rain, so there is no growth. A drought is when the work stops, when the pink slips are being handed out. He says he will keep you from worrying in a drought. He says, no, your daddy knows where you are, how you got there, and what you need. He knows how to arrange things, rearrange things, flip things, twit things, trip things. He knows how to do it. He says, stop acting like the heathen. So what do you all have to do? Verse 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. The key word is first. All that. No. You seek you first the kingdom. The kingdom is divine rule. That I'm in charge here. Righteousness is divine standard. That you're living to please me based on the standards as revealed in my word. So my rule, my standard, that's first. Now you got my attention. And one of the reasons why we're not seeing more of God is he's somewhere down the line. When we get to him. Seek ye first. Primacy, priority. The rule and the standards of God as your priority. And then he closes with this zinger. And it is a zinger because it's, it's so hard to do. He says in verse 34, so do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will take care of itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Well, yeah, God, you can say all that. You God. Okay. We are troubled by the problems of the past. We are troubled by the struggles of the present. And we are troubled by the uncertainty of the future. All those. And sometimes we trouble about all three at the same time. He says, I need to teach you, the Lord says, how to manage time. Most of us are crucified between two thieves, yesterday and tomorrow. Today is the tomorrow you worried about yesterday. You ever notice when you worried about Tomorrow, when you get to tomorrow, then you're worried about the next tomorrow. <laughs> he says, when it comes to living, you have to learn to do it one day at a time. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23, his mercies are new every day. And let me put it this way. He's not going to give you tomorrow's mercy today. Today, he's going to give you for today. And, and you know, one of the worst phrases in the world is you worrying and somebody comes to you and tell you stop worrying. Well, if I could do that, we wouldn't even be having this conversation, right? You need somebody who will take you higher so that you can see that when you have one master and one father and he's first... That worry does not have to be the controlling element in your life. Whenever you are tempted to worry, that is an automatic, immediate invitation to pray. On the spot, when worry shows up, you have then got a formal invitation in writing to pray. If you don't believe me, all you need to read is Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but with prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. This is not a prayer in the morning only. This is a prayer whenever worry shows up its ugly head. God has just said you and I need to have a conversation right now. Whenever the temptation is to worry, that is the invitation to pray and guess what he says and when you come to me come with thanksgiving come with thanksgiving I want you to give thanks 
in the midst of your request. And then he says, and the God of peace will meet you in that space. Psalm 55, 22 says, cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will meet you in that place. So here's what I want you to do. All of us, me, you, us. We need to change the place we put B-U-T. B-U-T. Because here's what we normally do. I trust God, but but you don't know what I'm going through, girl. I love the Lord, but I don't know how I'm going to pay these bills. I know he's able, but but you know, I'm going to throw in the towel. I know that's wrong. No, let's start. Let's try this again. There are only two verses in the Bible that mention his name. Chapter 3, verse 31 of Judges. Chapter 5, verse 6 of Judges. Yet, as we will discover, this man has a message for the men in this house today. For all of us, but especially for the men. We're told in chapter 5, verse 6, that during the days of Shemgar, Nobody was traveling along the highways. They went in roundabout ways. The main highways had been deserted. And if men wanted to go somewhere, if people wanted to travel, they had to go roundabout ways. They had to go on the dirt roads. They had to go on the side roads. They, they couldn't go on the main thoroughfare. To understand why we're told that, you have to understand the book of Judges. You see, the book of Judges talks about God's people in a failed scenario. Judges 21 verse 25 says that there was no king in those days and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. So, during the days of the judges, this was a time of what we would call the day postmodernism. No absolutes existed. Everybody had their own truth. Everybody did what was right in their own eyes. Everybody dealt with situations based on how they felt about it. There was no governing standard that governed everybody. So people made up their own rules, leading to cultural chaos. So people individually became their own God, became their own king and did their own thing because they were their own standard. There was no superintending governing guidance to which all the people subscribed. Enter the Philistines. The Philistines were the enemies of Israel. When they saw the chaos in the society, they took that as an invitation to take advantage of a disintegrating culture. Since the folk can't get along, since everybody else is making up their own rules, since there's chaos everywhere we look, we the Philistines are going to invade Israel. So you have an invasion occurring. That's why it talks about him slaying the Philistines because you have chaos. Now you don't need to read the Bible to see what that looks like. All you got to do is read the newspaper or look at the news and you will see today we are in a chaotic situation because people have made up their own rules about life about sexuality, about race, about culture, about class. Nobody getting along with anybody. And there's conflict in a person's own life, in our families fraying, in our communities divided over all of these issues. 
And so you get arguments back and forth and back and forth and marches about this and complaints about that. And there is chaos which always sets the stage for the enemy to invade the environment. So don't be surprised when things get worse when there is no standard. So that was the situation that brings us Shemgar. A chaotic situation of violence, of terrorism, of cultural collapse, of people defining themselves not by God, but by their own thinking, their own feelings, or their own information, opening the door for the Philistines to invade the land, which affected commerce because you could not do the main roads anymore. So any business that you needed to conduct, anybody you wanted to visit, you had to find a side way to get to them. You had to go roundabout because if you showed up on that major highway, the Philistines were going to get you. They had shut down mobility in the culture. So you've got major cultural collapse. In the midst of the crisis, we have 22 words. Judges chapter 3, verse 31, 22 words about a man named Shemgar. But these are 22 powerful, powerful words that gives each of us, but especially the men here, principles by which if you grab them, understand them, and inculcate them, how you can make a difference in spite of how bad things are. After him, that is, after the previous judge, Ehud, came, we're told, Shemgar. Now, the first thing I want you to note, first thing I want you to note about Shemgar is what he did before he became a judge. Because it says he slew 600 Philistines with an ox gourd. So that tells us what his job was before he became a, a judge over Israel. He's a farmer. Because an ox goad, an ox goad is an eight foot pole with a sharp metal tip on one end and a flat chisel area on the other end. The sharp end of the ox goad was used to goad the ox and keep them pulling the plow. So whenever they slowed down, you would prick it and prick it and prick it so it would pick back up for completing the farming responsibilities. The chisel on the back end, the flat surface of metal on the back end, was for the farmer to dig up roots and to dig up things that were obstructing the process of tilling the soil so that he could plant his seed. So this was a very important tool in the hand of a farmer. Farmers had ox goats. So we find out about Shemgar that he doesn't start off as a judge, he starts off as a farmer. Now why do you need to know that? You need to know that because the first thing you and I need to do is start where you are. You don't start where you want to be, you start where you are. A lot of folk are waiting till they get more money, more education, higher position, more notoriety before they do anything. There are many things in God's kingdom that do not get done because he's waiting on God's people to move with where they are right now. Shemgar, we find him on a farm. One of the great tragedies far too often in the life of men is procrastination. That's why the Bible says in uh, Ecclesiastes 12, serve the creator in the days of your youth. Don't wait till you get old. One of the things that far too many of us as men lack is vision. God specifically created men to express vision. When he created Adam, he says, Adam, here's the garden. 
Now, I want you to take this raw material and I want you to cultivate it and I want you to develop it and I want you to turn it into something beyond what you started with. A lot of times men are asking their wives to follow a park bus <laughs> or a park car because there has been no vision given for where God wants us to go. It is the responsibility of the man to set forth vision. The Bible says in uh, Joel chapter 2 verse 28, repeated again in Acts chapter 2 verse 17, it says, your sons shall have, your younger sons shall have vision and the old men will dream dreams. Doesn't bring the women into that. He says the women shall prophesy, but he says it will be the men who will have visions and it will be the older men who will dream dreams. So every man in here is supposed to be a vision caster and a dream maker. So it is the man's role to cast a vision. This is where we are. I don't like things as they are. So I'm going to seek God to give me a vision for what he wants to do to take it from where it is to where he wants it to be. Shemgar was dissatisfied. He's a farmer, but he sees that he can't travel down the main highway now. The main highways are blocked. The main highways of the caravans of Philistines are stopping me from getting my produce from my farm to farmer's market. It's stopping me from being able to go through the straight line down the highway because these, these evil people have taken over my neighborhood, my community, and now I got to find a, a roundabout way to go because those were the days. And it's all because there was no standard in the land. Inviting the enemy to take over. Shemgar is a farmer, but he's dissatisfied with the conditions. And so he takes an ox gourd. An ox gourd. Wait a minute. An ox gourd is for farming. That's what you do. You, you prod the animal along so he can keep pulling the plow. You dig up the roots and the, the brushes that are in the way. But because he's a man of vision, it dawns on him. I can use this ox goad, it's pronounced ox goad, I can use this ox goad for more than farming. I can use this ox goad to make this a better place to live, work, play, raise a family. I, I can use this tool that I thought was only for my economic prosperity. I can use this tool to do something more. God wants you to start right where you are, but guess what else he wants? He wants you to use what he's already given you. He's already had an ox gold. He's already got that right in his hand. He just never knew it could be used for more than farming. Until it dawns on him one day, and I'll tell you why it dawned on him in a few moments. It dawned on him one day, wait a minute. I already have what I need to do to get what God wants me to do done. See, a lot of folk are looking for new stuff when God has already given us the old stuff if we would ever learn to use it for his purposes. But because we've been so secularized in thinking, we use it for, you know, our growth, our income, our notoriety, our prestige, and, 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 and we forget that there is something bigger on the stage. It says that he slew 600 Philistines with the ox gold. Now let's talk about the odds. That, that's 600 to 1 odds. Uh, that's big odds. Now I know a lot of men in here have things against you, but it's probably not 600 to 1. It says 600 Philistines against one guy who only has one tool. He slew 600 Philistines with one ox gourd. Because... When you take what you have and God can get a hold of it right, you will be amazed at what he can do with it. He has one ox goat and this one ox goat gets rid of 600 problems. How many problems are in your life, in your world, in your job, on your career? How many problems are in your home, in your family? You say there are dozens and dozens of them. He had 600. He had one tool. 
But because he knew how to use the one tool the right way under divine influence, it was able to get the job done. If God could ever get a hold of the ox goad in your life, what he has handed you that he wants to use for something bigger than just your little small world because you're dissatisfied with the confusion, you're dissatisfied with the crime, you're dissatisfied with the chaos, you're dissatisfied with the terrorism, but now you want to take what God has given you, hand it back to him. All David had was a stone. That's all he had. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? that would taunt the armies of the living God. He just had a stone and a slingshot, but he also had one thing. He says, you come to me with all that equipment, Goliath. I come to you in the name of the Lord. So let's see what he does with this stone when I let it go. Holy Ghost took the stone, drew it into Goliath's head. He chopped off Goliath's head and said, hey, y'all. In other words, all he needed was what he had. It just had to get sanctified by God so that it could now do something bigger than it could ever do on its own. All Samson had was the jawbone of a donkey. A thousand Philistines came against him. He put himself in the crevice of the rock and the Bible says when the Spirit of God came on him, he slew 1,000 Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. Why? Because it was no longer just the jawbone of a donkey. God had gotten a hold of that thing and he did something bigger with that than Samson could ever do on his own. All the little boy had was sardines and crackers, a couple of fish and some barley loaves, but Jesus turned it into a Moby Dick sandwich. But he only turned it into a Moby Dick sandwich when the little boy gave his sardines and crackers to Jesus Christ. And when he gave it to Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ prayed over it and it did something bigger than what the boy could ever do on its own. What I'm trying to say to you is that if you will allow God as a man to give you a vision for what he wants to do with your life, he will blow your mind and how, as to how he can take a little and do a lot with it. So the question on the floor now is, how do you, how do you defeat 600 when it's only you and all you have is an ox goad? I mean, how do you, how do you do that? You don't do it all at one time. If 600 come at you at one time, they had cut off all the roads, all the highways, which means they weren't all in one place at one time. See, they're spread out among the different highways. So he had a bunch of gangs he had to deal with. So he may have 25 here and 50 here. He looked at his ox goad and said, hmm, nah, this could be a Tomahawk missile. It's sharp on one side, flat on the other side, and I know how to use it because I've been farming with this thing for years. Second Chronicles 16, 9 says, God is looking for somebody. He's searching for somebody who he can use to show himself strong through. God wants to show off. His problem is finding somebody. He's had problems finding somebody, and as we saw with other scriptures, especially finding a man, because there's some things he only wants to do through a man. Not because women aren't critical, important, and strategic, but there are some things he wants to get men to do. First Chronicles 4, verse 9 and 10, we are familiar with the prayer of Jabez. The word Jabez means pain. Yeah. One day, J expand my borders. Yeah. Remove evil from me. Oh, yeah. He cries out to God to change his life. He said what many in our, men in our culture need to say today, and even in our, in our churches, I was made for more than this. 
I wasn't just made to be pain all of my life. I don't want to go out like that. I want to go out victorious. I want to go out. I want to go out with confidence. So he cried out to God. And the Bible says, and when he cried out to God, the Lord heard him and answered each one of his prayers. We can't get men to drop to their knees. We can't get men to submit to God. We can't get men to cultivate a relationship with God underneath the rule of God. What was Shemgar's secret? What was the key that shifted his life so that he became a judge and one man saved the whole nation? Says he saved Israel. One man with an ox goad. What was his secret? Well, you have to understand how you got to be a judge. Let me show you the first judge. Chapter 3, verse 10. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he judged Israel. There it is. You know how you became a judge? God took over your life. That's how you became a judge. The Spirit of the Lord came and the Spirit of the Lord grew.